After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up to a high mountain where they were all alone. And there he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before him Elijah, Moses, and those who were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. They were coming down the mountain. Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This morning, we celebrate the presence of Christ by the lighting of the Christ candle. Molly Brock will come light our candle this morning. What does it take for God to get your attention? For Moses, it was a burning bush. For David, it was through a conversation that he had with Nathan when Nathan told him a story about a rich man who had everything, yet when a traveler came through, he stole from a poor man. Paul the Apostle had the opportunity to go to Damascus to to breathe threats and to persecute the church when he encountered God through a bright light. For Pharaoh, it was through the loss of his son, his firstborn son, when it was completely avoidable. These and more understand the significance of ignoring God. Whether we're avoiding God through our weakness or through our stubbornness, we know that God remains. God is the beginning and God is the end. He is ever present and he cannot be ignored. It's through a season like Lent when we have the opportunity to discipline ourselves, to create an atmosphere in our own life and our own patterns where we encounter God in unique kinds of ways, where we really put ourselves in a place where God might have our attention. We do that in a variety of ways, and as we walk through this together as a church and as individuals, we each experience this in our own way, in a variety of ways. But I would just ask you this morning to seize this opportunity it's a, it's a time of year for us that it's easy to let something like this pass, but it, it's a time where we really want to put ourselves in a place where we might be attentive to what God wants to say to us. This morning, we're going to hear about two characters that I've already mentioned, Moses and Pharaoh. And they're going to encounter God. We want to read this morning in chapter 6 of Exodus at the, in the 28th verse and in the first few verses of chapter 7. If you have a text, uh, you can follow us along in your own text or you can follow along on the screens as I read this morning. It says, Now when the Lord spoke to Moses in Egypt, he said to him, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, uh, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, everything I tell you. But... Moses said to the Lord, Since I speak with faltering lips, why would Pharaoh listen to me? Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I've made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You're to say everything I command you, and your brother Aaron is to tell the Pharaoh uh, to let the Israelites go out of his country. But... I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. 
Then I will lay my hand on Egypt, and with mighty acts of judgment, I will bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. When God wants our attention, he deserves our attention. When God wants our attention, he can have our attention. This morning we look at sort of a contrast of two different people in their response to God and God getting their attention. One is Moses. Now we followed with Moses for a few chapters now. We're a little bit familiar with the story. He encounters God through the burning bush. He goes up to the bush and God speaks to him through that bush. And at that moment he's still struggling with this fact in his life that he's not a good speaker. He has faltering speech. Now, we don't know if he's not a good communicator, if there were those types back in that day. Or maybe he stuttered. Or maybe he just had an anxiety problem where he felt like that if he began to talk, he couldn't get what he wanted to say out. He didn't want to mess up what God had intended to do through his life, and so he confessed his weakness. In fact, when you go back into chapters 3 and 4 and then again in 6, seven times he confessed his weakness. You know, the Jews had an idea about the number seven. It was the perfect number. Maybe what we see in the life of Moses this morning is that he demonstrates for us perfect weakness. If you've ever felt weak, incapable of maybe being able to do something that you sense that God was leading you into. Maybe you put it in words like, maybe God is stretching me at this moment in my life. Maybe God is asking me to do something that's greater than what I feel like that I can take on. Remember Moses and his perfect weakness. If God can use Moses and find a way to bring his people out of Egypt through him, God can use you in the ways that he needs to use you. Moses became prepared and God used him through weakness. It's something that we ought to understand. It's something that we live with daily with our own inadequacies and problems and things that separate us uh, with, with our relationship with God. There's a lot of excuses that we could make that could be disguised as weakness for us not doing what God asked. Paul understood this kind of weakness. This Moses kind of weakness. He says in 2 Corinthians, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul had some kind of condition. And repeatedly he had asked God to take that from him, to remove that from his life. And when God didn't, over time, this is what Paul concluded, that he was made perfect. In weakness. That's counterintuitive for us, right? That we think that we go through this life and we practice these disciplines so that we might become stronger, so that we might understand what strength is life is like in the Christian life, and yet we have this idea and picture before us today of weakness being perfect. Because in that weakness, God is made strong. He said this, you may have a speech problem, Moses, but look at what I'm about to do. You're going to be God to Pharaoh. Now, that's an interesting sentence, right? That's an interesting concept that someone, uh, God tells Moses at this moment that I know that you're weak and you're not very good at speaking, so we're going to let Aaron do that. But when you appear before Pharaoh, you're going to appear and you're going to be God to him. Now, I don't know what your text looks like there. A lot of, a lot of uh, time, I, times that I read this, it was a little g, but most often it was a capital G. That God really was placing himself in the life of Moses at that moment to appear before Pharaoh. So when he spoke, he spoke through Moses and Aaron to Pharaoh, directly to Pharaoh. He said to him, you are going to be God. 
to Pharaoh. We ought to understand that. Post-resurrection believers ought to understand that a bit, that we know that Christ comes to live in us and God demonstrates himself to the world through us. Not a strange thought at all that we are Jesus to the world. He would become confident for, through his dependence on God through this experience. He would come to Pharaoh and, and he would try to warn Pharaoh of these plagues. Time and again, Pharaoh went through this, this process of, of struggling through how to react and, and how, to, how to participate and, and hold on to what he had already been given and what he had already taken charge of and not lose that, yet not also being destroyed by the Israelites and their God. He came so close. He came so close. But his stubbornness kept him from following God. At any moment, he could have relented and said, I will let God's people go. I will do that. But rather, he kept finding excuses. Those excuses became a stubbornness in his spirit. You see, the first couple of times that there were plagues, he had his magicians come in, and they had them perform the same kinds of acts. So no big deal. Anyone, my guys can do that. The plagues progressed. The magicians could no longer perform the acts that Moses, that God was doing through Moses. And now uh, Pharaoh's in a position where he's beginning to listen to God. He's be his heart is beginning to soften, and he's beginning to relent. He's wanting to give in, but there's something about him at that, on those moments where he can't quite let go. Let me just stop right here and talk about those of us who have a bit of a stubborn spirit. There are a lot of things that can stand between you and having the attention of God. There are a lot of things that can occur in a person's life, whether it's through the, the acts of sin and disobedience, or possibly just feeling like we are so weak, similar to Moses. But those of us who have a stubborn spirit have a bit of a different problem. An unwillingness. <coughs> I was afraid that was going to happen. It's been happening for three weeks. <clears throat> a stubborn spirit demonstrates an unwillingness to let go of what you think you have. To follow God. An unwillingness to let go of what you think you have in order to follow God. But here's the truth. <coughs> Clear to go. That God will become known. God will make provision. God has made provision. God will make himself known. But wouldn't you rather being a, be a participant in what God is doing? Wouldn't you rather be willing to, to move out of the way through your weakness or through your stubbornness and be a full-on participant in what God is doing? He says that he'll be known through his mighty acts. These mighty acts of God didn't end here. They didn't end with these plagues and the, and the growing significance of the plagues in the life of the Egyptians. God's mighty acts have continued up until today. When we look, when God has our attention, we can see the demonstration of his mighty acts in our life and in our experience. He said that he had become known through his deliverance. 
What a great day because the message of Exodus is, is that redemptive message of God bringing his people out of the slavery that they, were, they had known in their life into a time of freedom. And as we understand that redemptive message, not just for a people who've gone on before us, but when we understand that redemptive message for ourselves, we understand what it means to be delivered by Christ. Delivered from our weakness, delivered from our stubbornness, delivered into a freedom that helps us to serve and live as Christ designed us to serve and live. Israel would ultimately be released from the life that had enslaved them. But here's the question for us. Will we be willing to receive God in the way that we can also be released from the things that enslave us? During Lent, the part of the process of the tradition of Lent is giving something up. I had sort of a an epiphany this week in, in reading and trying to understand Lent. Lent is, uh, the process is, is really a lot of religious tradition that really helps us uh, exercise our faith and demonstrate our faith. And in doing that, so often we depend solely on something that we give up on Ash Wednesday and we carry that through the 47 days or the 40 if you're not including Sundays. I came to this conclusion. Maybe that this Lenten experience for us is not about giving up something that we last for 47 days, but it could be something that we give up, that we look at each day and say, God, what is it that I do today that will help you to deliver me from my enslavement? Maybe it's a daily thing. Maybe it's a daily process of looking at our life, looking at ourself, asking God to deliver us from this enslavement that we feel in our own life. It changes from day to day. That's why I think that that idea may be significant for us or helpful for some of us who are going through this Lenten experience. So let me ask you this question. What does it take for God to get your attention? How have you prepared your response? Will you, will you be willing to ready yourself and put yourself in that place where, where God does begin to speak to you? His voice for you is crystal clear. That's the goal this morning. That we respond to him in our heart, in our life, where we might know that it's him speaking to us and we have readied ourselves. Let's respond to him this morning. Let me lead us in prayer, then we'll sing.